Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll get started here in just a moment, so if you want to grab your last slice of pizza and grab a seat, that would be awesome. All right, or maybe we'll just start now since everybody got really quiet. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jason Grigsby. I'm one of the organizers of Mobile Portland. Thank you all for being here. Um, I've got a great panel today. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, and I've just got a few things to take care of before we get started. Uh, first off, um, just a bit of our agenda. We've had some networking, some pizza eating, um, then we're going to do some introductions, um, some announcements, and then uh, we'll get on to presentation. want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, uh, Urban Airship and ProFocus. ProFocus has provided all of the pizza and drinks for tonight. Um, and John, do you, uh, do you want to... Say a word real quick. Hi, thanks. Uh, ProFocus is really proud and happy to be a sponsor here tonight. And uh, ProFocus is a technology services company. Uh, we help companies develop software, uh, manage their IT infrastructure, uh, customize business applications, and, and design and engineer um, technology products. And so, yeah, if, you, uh, if you're a company that could use those kinds of services, or if you're a technology professional that might be interested in a new opportunity, I'd uh, love to meet you. Thanks. And um, I was going to grab, hey Ramsey, you want to say something for Urban Airship? So I can definitely say something for Urban Airship, but I'd be doing all of us an injustice if I didn't give it to <laughs> say something for Urban Airship. So. <laughs> all right, let's hear it for Ramsey. <laughs> yeah, welcome to our building. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so I will say that they're probably hiring for something because they're always hiring for something, so you should uh, check that out. I just realized also that, um, that I, I deleted a slide uh, that I wanted to mention, just briefly, like what Mobile Portland is and what's going on. So we're a group focused on mobile technology. We meet once a month um, on the fourth Monday of every month to talk about it, um, or at least we will be until the end of March. Uh, which is an announcement, um, March will be our last meeting, so we're sort of ending on a high note. We've got the panel tonight, um, we've got one of two really cool topics for next month, and I'm not sure which one's going to work out yet, um, but we've got a couple of things in the hopper, and then in March we're talking to a speaker, um, which I'm, hope I'm hoping to get confirmation on in the next day or two from New York City, who would be flying in for that final meeting. Um, so really, really exciting stuff. Um, for those of you here, how many of you, is this your first Mobile Portland meeting? Please raise your hand. Yeah, that's awesome. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you should come for the next few months. It's going to be awesome. Um, all right. Uh, we usually take a moment to see if people have uh, job openings or, say, like an event that's going on that they want to announce. Um, please keep it incredibly short. Elia will be wandering around, so raise your hand, and he will give you a microphone to announce what's going on. Hi, um, uh, my name is Tristan. I work for uh, Simple Finance here in town. We just moved into a new office space here in the world. Uh, we're hiring for all kinds of positions, uh, especially mobile. So if you're an iOS or an Android engineer, I'd love to talk to you. We're also hiring for non-engineering positions. You can check out our careers page at simple.com slash careers. And I can be hanging out if you just want to chat about mobile or talk about job opportunities. Uh, Hey, I'm Dave from Crowd Compass, and we're hosting a mobile and design focused hackathon uh, starting uh, February 6th through the 8th, so it's that weekend, and it's coincidental with Startup Week. So there's some more information over there. It's the website's Little Oregon Laboratory. So I'm Rob Mills, I'm with Rubmark Community Credit Union. Uh, we are looking for a .NET developer uh, with responsive design. And if you can bring along a database uh, developer and an and a apps person with you, we'd greatly appreciate it. <laughs> There's one over here. Preferably if we could switch it between sides so the idea has to run back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hi, my name is 
Michael Crawford. I've been a software engineer for 27 years. I've decided I would do well to teach what I know to young people. Um, and so I've started a business called uh, um, Socratic Professional Mentoring. The website is SocratesPDX.com, S-O-C-R-A-T-E-S-P-D-X.com. Um, it's a very new website, so please forgive my web design. I'll fix it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> this kind of mentoring is often very expensive, but that's not really my aim. My aim is to help the young people and to do something about the fact that although there are a great many apps in uh, Google Play and the iTunes App Store, many of them get very poor reviews. I know how to fix that, and I would like to help you fix your products, help you fix your websites. Like you, if you own a business I, or, or operate one, I'd like to help you succeed. Um, I know this needs to be quick, I just want to say my upfront prices will be a great deal less than it is usually charged for this kind of thing, but my pay will be based on you achieving the results that you desire for the long run, for the say, uh, a year. Thank you. Any others? I'm Jesse. I do uh, mobile and event hardware development. So if you're a software developer but you need hardware for it, I can probably help you. All right, going once, going twice. All right, excellent. So we are here to talk about these things and the many other things that are multi-shaped. And um, so it's really interesting to me to watch this market really start to take off and the interest in it take off, again, as Apple creates a product in this space. But um, <coughs> Android has had watches for a while. We've had Fitbits, we've had fuel bands, we've had a bunch of different devices that are wearable. Um, as a matter of fact, I met uh, Rachel Calmer um, last summer at Fucan, uh, and she had, <coughs> I can't remember how many devices on her. Um, she works for a company that, I'm sorry? All of them. She has all of them, yes. Um, it was really remarkable. And, and what was interesting was when I spoke to her about why she was doing this, it wasn't a desire to, um, to quantify everything that she did. And we'll talk a little bit about quantified self, uh, the panel will, in a little bit. But actually what she was interested in was what happens with this information. She actually came from a medical research background. And what happens with the information when we're able to aggregate it across whole sections of society and able to understand maybe what sort of precipitating data might happen before, say, a heart attack or something like that. And understanding how these different sensors share information and how they measure things differently. Um, and it was an eye-opening experience, really, listening to her talk about this data and these devices in sort of like not a novelty way, but in a really big societal way. Um, so. That's one thing that I, I'd like you guys to keep in mind as we talk to the panel, is that this is not just technology for technology's sake, but there might actually be bigger implications. Um, but there are opportunities related to Mary Meeker, who oftentimes does these, um, these events or these presentations. Uh, she's been doing them for years, Internet Trends. Uh, she was originally with, um, I can't remember the analyst, but now she's with Kleiner Perkins. And she's talking about this idea that, that we've got technology cycles and that Every technology cycle is significantly bigger than the previous technology cycle. Um, and that the winners of the previous technology cycle are oftentimes not the winners of the next technology cycle. And one of the things she started talking about in 2014 is that normally these technology cycles take a decade. Decade between technology cycles. But that wearables, we see wearables coming in much, much more quickly. And these wearables tend to, or these technology cycles tend to be the sort of thing where there's a 10x number of devices from one cycle to the next. I don't know whether this will be true when it comes to wearables, but if it is, that is, that is an astounding number. Um, so there seems to be tremendous opportunity here. It's not really clear what these devices will look like, whether they are watches, whether they are other things, and how, say, watches fit into other devices like Google Glass. And that's why I'm very, very happy to have such a fantastic panel here today. 
and um, I want to introduce them. So first I'll start with uh, Taylor Hatmaker. Uh, she is the technology editor for Daily Dot. Um, she's been covering wearables market extensively. Um, she just returned from CES where she got to look at some of the things that are coming up. And she's an avid Google Glass user, so we get a perspective um, from sort of a different realm than the watches. Uh, please join me in welcoming Taylor. Brent Heigelke? Damn it, I knew I was going to mess it up, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, he is the Chief Marketing Officer for Urban Airship. Um, a couple of weeks ago, he was interviewed by AdAge, talking a bit about sort of what he's seen Urban Airship's customers doing with Apple Watch, what they're interested in, how they're thinking about it working. A lot of the things related to Apple Watch are actually notification-based and glance-based. Um, so I think he's going to have a really great perspective uh, for us in sharing what people are working on with Apple Watch. Please join me in welcoming Brent. Sean <laughs> Corinchy. Um, oh, I should tell the panels just real quick while it's on my mind. These microphones tend to cut out a little bit, so if you keep them closer to your mouth, they don't cut out quite as much, but they will cut out, and I'm sorry. It seems to be unavoidable. Uh, so Josh works as a researcher for Nokia, 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 is it Nokia? Uh, not finished today. Yes, okay, so not finished today. Um, looking at Internet of Things and wearables, um, and so he's going to be able to help us with some of the academics and some of the stuff that's coming down the pipe. Um, please welcome Josh. And last but not least, Aaron Parakey um, is the CTO of Esri's uh, Portland R&D Center. Uh, he's also been tracking um, where he is and what he eats and all of these sorts of things using a pebble and posting it publicly on his site. You can go look at that um, at any point. Um, and so he's been talking a little bit about how, um, sort of what it means to do this quantify itself and then also a bit of you know, the privacy and data implications of doing so. So please welcome Aaron. All right, so um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the format of the panel. Uh, I'm going to start out with a couple of questions, question for each of the panels to give them an opportunity to sort of talk about the perspective that they bring, um, give them a little background, oh, you guys need mics. Um, and then um, I'll ask a few more questions and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So uh, actually, I'm, uh, let's see here, I'm going to start with Brent, if that's all right. Um, so Brent, you were recently interviewed in AdAge about your enthusiasm for Apple Watch. Um, in that, you talked a bit about how the brands that you've been talking to are looking at this as a way to extend the relationship with the brands and also um, potentially gathering more information and more data, uh, which is not, like I've seen a lot of people talking about um, the notifications and sort of alerting people of events, but not so much from a data collection perspective. Um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and then just generally about what you see Urban Airship customers um, doing with Apple Watch or what they, what they seem to be excited about when it comes to watch technology generally. Okay, that's like seven questions. In one. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think what's interesting about the watch from a thinking about it from a brand standpoint. So, you know, this big trend towards brands building apps that have value in the consumer's life. And if, the, if the app has value, then that, that app tends to be sticky. If not, it ends up being you know flavor of the week gets thrown off. So, when you start thinking about the watch, what's what's that opportunity to extend that? It's interesting because the watch has the potential to become the remote control for that brand. And what I mean by that is think about the television. You know, if, if the remote control hadn't been invented, then the TV economy would not have blossomed with the cable and hundreds of channels. And, and, and how often do you actually interact with your TV versus how often do you interact with your remote control? You know, I would say, you know, it's, it's a thousand times more. We, we touch our remote, but we probably barely ever touch our TV. So the potential is for the watch to become that remote control for that branded app experience, if brands do it right. And that is what leads to the data. 
as you mentioned, notifications are one of the primary use cases for the watch. So that's that's good for a membership. That's good for, for the company uh, because it means now notifications become you know not just this kind of tack on, but actually the fundamental strategy for that brand. It's like how do you get the consumer to want your notification, and the watch becomes that more control for it. Now what's interesting is you know, notifications have become interactive. So they're actually notifications is actually kind of the wrong term today because a notification is like a tap on the shoulder and you could actually now do things within the notification. You could put buttons in there that drive actions. You could say, you know, yes, no, um, here's a poll, respond to your you know your choice. Do you want to hear more? Uh, vote. There's all kinds of actions you can take. Shop now, remind you later. So when you think about that layered onto a wearable, it's a lot easier just to hit those kind of actions on a watch, not even have to pull out your device at all. And that becomes a remote control function, which means more consumers might re, you know, respond, react, and all of that is data. And all that can be used for refining the experiences. So if you respond to a brand over and over again, they can build a better experience for you. You can start learning from each response. And so over time, as sort of you know artificial intelligence and machine learning is applied to this, it can start getting really good, better experiences for consumers. So that's the data side that I think is, is really interesting. Is thinking about you know the ability for a brand, in, think you know think Starbucks, think Nike, think uh, Walgreens, think you know all these brands that want to have and need to have a role in your life. How do they take advantage of this to? Improve your life because that's you know the, the reality is is you know there's the, the whole world of marketing is completely on its foundational shaking because of devices and the watch is going to take that to another degree because we're going to have an unbelievably high bar for what we're going to allow you know literally kind of shake our wrist and, and have a, a, a visceral reaction to it. so when you think about how does a brand earn that relationship right it's going to have to give you real value. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Taylor, um, so you've been you've been watching wearables for a while now and experimenting with them. And so I guess there are a couple of questions that I have. Um, it seems like wearables have been a bit niche over time. And the feeling that I have about that is that that may be changing. And I'm wondering if you feel that way and then sort of what you saw at CES sort of as where this stuff might be going, um, things that we should be looking for. I definitely do feel like that's changing. Um, I think, you know, obviously Apple, Apple's watch is right around the corner and that's going to blow the market wide open. Just like that's what Apple does best, it blows it wide open. And I definitely foresee that happening. Um, but in terms of, I guess, mainstream consumer adoption, I see uh, wearables developing obviously in parallel with the Internet of Things, which was like the main buzzword, you know, buzz term at CES this year, the Consumer Electronics Show, for those of you who are familiar, it's a huge sort of terrible sort of wonderful thing that happens in <laughs> Las Vegas every year. Um, but it's just, you know, every consumer device imaginable and then like four knockoffs of each of those on display, literally. Um, so uh, it's really cool because you go, you know, you see the, you see the new stuff and um, it, everyone just has different ideas. It's, it's, it's a mess, but it's great. Um, and I think the most, the most compelling theme that I saw that made me believe I guess in the mainstream um, potential for, for wearables was that companies seem to, seem to be starting to understand the compromise necessary to make these devices work. And I think looking at Pebble particularly, um, I had a Pebble for like day one and obviously a Kickstarter supporter. I think Pebble understood the compromises that needed to happen to make a device relevant in your everyday life. If it's, if it's a wearable, it needs to do something compelling beyond our smartphones obviously, and it needs to you know last longer than a day. I feel like battery life is absolutely critical and people are sort of starting to figure out that that's like, uh, you know, everything. That's really the crux of, of a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, wearable technology, in my opinion. But um, some of the most interesting devices I saw at CES and Vegas this year were, well, ones that didn't just outright suck, which were pretty rare, actually, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I, I mean, I think we're getting there, and everything's interesting, even if it sucks a little bit. Um, uh, a lot of the devices sort of approached the battery life issue in interesting ways that made them um, more viable, I think. Like uh, the Withings Activity Pop Watch, I have no idea how to say that, it's the weirdest name. 
but it doesn't even have like an LCD screen. It's a fitness tracker and a smartwatch combined, but it kind of like offloads everything to the phone, so you know it can last significantly longer and stay you know relevant in our daily lives. And I saw a lot of devices starting to understand that they can't have it all, and I think that's really really important for mainstream adoption. Thank you. Thank you. And um, it's interesting. I mean, the battery life is one of the questions that Apple hasn't answered about their their watch. And battery life. Uh, so you you brought your Google Glass today. Um, every time I've asked to borrow a Google Glass, it's been dead. Is yours charged? Uh, we can find out. It's in my okay. bag. We can try and find it. I've, I've actually got um, uh, two Android Wear devices that are from Mobile Portland's device lab here with us, and um, and they are charging as well. Uh, so charging these devices tends to be a problem. Uh, Josh, um, so in your job, you're re researching both Internet of Things and wearables. Um, and I guess, I guess sort of related to something Taylor said, I'm curious whether you see these as, like, are these actually distinctly different things, or are they the same thing? Um, and um, are, you know, are they separate in some fundamental way? Um, and then, sort of following on that, like, what are you seeing from a research perspective that may surprise us, things that, that may be coming? Um, so first I should probably clarify what I do. Uh, I was at home for a couple of years doing developer relations, and after everything was canceled, we were the last, I said, I'm done with phones, I'm going to Nokia, to the research group, which is why I'm not working for Microsoft now, mm -hmm. or laid off. So my job is, uh, I'm a user interface specialist, we prototype things. Uh, one of the, you know, the research groups that has like, a bunch of PhDs says, we wrote a paper, this is cool, why don't you go build it? Or someone comes and says, we heard this is a new hot thing, how much would it cost us to actually make something like this? It's our competition. So I get to go out, buy components, I get to go buy the first of everything. I have a bunch of smart watches at home, I have a, the 3D headset, the Oculus. Oculus Rift. So I get to play with all these things, um, which is both exciting and profoundly disappointing. Because, you know, I grew up reading science fiction, and in science fiction everything works perfectly, and the robot doesn't. But I'm actually not worried about the technology itself. Yes, the screens aren't very bright, the battery life sucks, but we, you know, we've seen how Moore's Law fixes all of those things. You know, in a couple iterations, the battery life would be fine. I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is usage of the data and who owns the data. And I think that's fundamentally the difference between wearables and Internet of Things. Internet of Things isn't something that you wear. Um, it's really kind of a catch-all term, but we could probably classify it in things that live in your home and things that live in somebody else's place, be it a retail establishment, like a store the mall, or at your employer's office. And the difference is really what's happening with that data. And that's the thing that I've spent the most time looking at. Because we can solve the technology issues, but what happens to that data? Does it get aggregated? Can it be used against you? Um, if I have three different sensors that all collect three different pieces of data, how can I combine them for my own benefit when they're all stored in three different cloud services that don't talk to each other? And that's, you know, the hardware, that's a problem that will be solved you know, in a couple generations. It's getting all the pieces to talk to each other in a useful way that still preserves my safety and privacy that I work on. And that's where I feel like are the current uh, open holes next five years, we're going to find out what happens. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, you've been, you've been publishing all of your information publicly for a while. Um, so I'm curious, uh, and I know you, um, you recently gave a talk on data privacy, so I think we'll come back to that maybe as the first question afterwards. But before we get to that, I wanted to ask you uh, maybe to tell us what quantified self is for those who haven't, aren't familiar with the term, um, sort of what you're doing, what your experiments have been like, and, and what you've learned from um, publishing that information. Sure, so um, uh, quantified itself is a term that encompasses a lot of um, basically just tracking data about usually yourself, um, could be about about your environment. Um, and then what you actually do with that is sort of up for debate and people have different takes on, on why they do that. Uh, sometimes it's behavior modification, sometimes it's just interest. Um, so uh, I've, I've been experimenting with a lot of things over the years. Um, my longest running data set is my location. 
So I've had a GPS uh, in my phone since 2008. And this was a uh, Windows phone before the iPhone had GPS, and then I switched to an Android phone, and I've been using an iPhone since, since that. Um, and uh, basically, it's logging constantly. Every couple seconds, there's a new point report. So it's a massive data set. Um, I do a number of things with that, but I won't go into that right now. Um, I, I try to collect as much data about myself as I can, and, and sort of uh, in the easiest way possible, and then figure out what to do with it later. Uh, I'm not willing to go to too much effort to collect the data, so I'll look for the easiest way to automate that process. So um, for a while, my, my GPS tracking, I would, because my network was so terrible uh, in 2008, I would turn it on and off when I would get into a, a space that I wasn't going to be moving in for a while. And if I would leave the space, I would turn it back on. I don't have to do it anymore. The, the phones have gotten much better about sort of managing that themselves. Um, so now I sort of leave it on most of the time. Unless my battery is at like 20%, and I try to save it a little bit more. Um, other things I've been tracking, uh, my, my I think second longest running data set is sleep. So I have logs of how much I've slept every night since November 2011. And um, that is all thanks to the job, which I'm still wearing. And uh, the reason that this one has worked so well is because its uh, battery lasts like eight days because there's no screen. And uh, it doesn't do a whole lot. And it's, so I, I can always wear it and barely ever charge it, which means when I go to bed, it's already on my wrist. I don't have to like fumble for a phone or fumble for the other thing or like fiddle with the screen and look at something. I can just sort of do it without looking. Um, I've been wearing a Pebble since um, since they launched on Kickstarter, and um, this one's also been great as well. The battery life is about three days, so it can be better, but it's not terrible. Uh, the thing I've been doing with this lately is tracking what I eat. Because um, so I've been wanting to track what I eat for a very long time, and it's very hard to do that because it's a very high cost thing to track. Uh, I, I actually started by just being like, all right, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to struggle and take out my phone, open the notes app, and just write it down. And uh, I was actually did that for about nine months and realized um, the granularity at which I could actually sustain that. And it's, it's a trade-off thing, again, like you were saying, where you have to be willing to make trade-offs in terms of how what your device can do versus how long it can last and how much people have to interact with it. Um, and what I've got now on the Pebble is an app arrow, which um, basically gives me a list of the most common things I need, and I can choose from that list. And if it's not on the list, I'll either open my phone or click the other button and fill it in later. And it turns out that works pretty well. And it's compromised, because I can't do everything from it, but it's OK. Uh, so, I think that's a, it's a really important point is um, you know, the, the willingness to, to use the system, even for someone like me who's like super dedicated to it, like there are things I won't use because they take too much effort. Um, the, the Fitbit's a good example. Fitbit does sleep tracking just like Java, and it takes too much effort for me to use it for that. So you have to be willing to make the trade-offs of, of functionality, battery life, uh, shininess, uh, <laughs> whatever, for, uh, for, to get people to actually <laughs> Um, so, I, I guess I want to follow up just a little bit on this idea of uh, data, data with privacy and control before we sort of move on to opportunities. Um, so, both Josh and Aaron both mentioned this idea about you know what data you track and who has access to that information and sort of what's happening in that space. And I know Aaron, you had created a presentation on that. And I just wondered if any of the panelists had had ideas or, or thoughts on what's happening. Um, sort of like what we should be watching for as we decide whether to bring one of these devices into our house and, and use them on a daily basis. Uh, I guess I'll start by saying I think that um, the way that most of these things are going right now is is not an ideal solution, where the easiest way to build an app, build a product right now, especially hardware, is to also run a cloud service that the data syncs to, because it's the easiest thing to do. You can just sort of have control of the whole ecosystem yourself as a, as a company. And, um, that's how it has to go right now in order for the products to evolve quickly. But that's not an ideal situation to be in. Ideally, you know, this device and this device can sync to something that's under my own control, and I can replace that with some other product that I like better that stores the data. Um, that's sort of an ideal situation. And it's totally not feasible to do while also iterating on the hardware in the, you know, the world ecosystem. But um, ideally, the data that you're generating from these devices is entirely under your own control and never even hits the, the servers of the, party, the, of the company that made the device, because they shouldn't need to do that. Uh, so hopefully we can get there. 
but it's not going to be quick. Um, ideally, you would have essentially your own cloud service. I think that's probably not going to be practical. You are going to have to delegate that to a trusted third party, probably, which is fine. We do, you know, I have a bank. I trust my bank, and I give them my money in exchange. They're regulated by the government. Do we want regulation of this? I don't know. Um, but I always have the option of leaving the bank. I can take my money from the bank and know that any other bank is more than happy to take my money. And there won't be any conversion issues or format issues you know, with money. It's a standard. So I think the biggest, the biggest way we can battle the privacy and security issues is by making sure that you can always take your data and leave. And if they don't work out well, I can take my data, and the fact that I can take it means that they're more likely to work hard to make sure that they're transparent, that they're secure. You know, uh, I shop a lot less at Target since they have their big data reach. You know, that was a significant thing for me. And my mom told me that. My mom knows nothing about security, but she heard that Target got hacked. You know, these, these events are going to get bigger and bigger and have more and more impact. If you have the right to take your data, which means not just the legal right, but that it's actually, you can retrieve all of it in a single chunk conveniently, you don't have to mail order it, that it's in a format that can be accepted by others. If you have that portability, then most of these other issues will get solved by the um, Right now, the watches, right, are platform specific. You get Apple Watch with Apple and um, Android with is it Android doesn't work with other devices? Microsoft maybe works with others. Is that correct, Taylor? Do you know by chance? Um, oh. Sorry, I put you on the spot. No. <laughs> um, so we have another piece of the puzzle that's that's um, that's causing us to get that buy-in. Uh, do you see? I mean, I guess at this point in time, um, there, as you're saying, Aaron, there doesn't seem to be any way around that, right? Like we're we're choosing those ecosystems. Um, everybody's nodding their heads. Okay. Um, so one of the other questions that I wanted to ask, um, and maybe this is a good question for Brent or others on the panel, one of the things that I hear as criticisms when people talk about watches is sort of the constant interruptions, right? Like the idea that it's bad enough that my phone's buzzing, now my watch is buzzing at the same time. Like, um, I, I'm curious if you guys have had any experience with that, if you're like, how individuals, like, is it is it better than having your watch buzz, or worse, or does anyone have any sense of that? So I'll address all just a couple things that I think are interesting about what Apple's doing, and, and uh, so, you know, there's this new concept of the glanceable moment that they're talking about, which is you know, the ability for that sort of effortless experience, so you don't even, you know, it's not like you're really interrupted, but rather just there's a moment where you glance and you decide whether you want to look more or not. So there's, there's going to be a long form and short, short form and long form notifications. And it's going to sense if you keep your arm up or not. So if you keep your arm up in the air, looking at it, and saying, oh, this person wants to see more, and it'll automatically show a longer form. So, you know, the, I think the reality is, is that if, if these, and, and, and Apple will have a watch uh, app, right? So you can control it. Which, which of these apps can send you a notification. So you know, I think people will become tuned in. And I think, you know, back to what I was saying earlier, the, 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 the bar is going to become higher. You know, if you have 100 apps on your device and that, on, your, on your iPhone, or, you know, which is kind of the average right now, you may let 10 of those apps send you notifications. You know, and within those 10, you might even you know, tune five of them to really you know, do something special. So, you know, I think I think the reality is the market will learn, you know, how much how much interruption people will take. But I think this idea that you know today the average person looks at their iPhone, I think it's two hundred times a day. You know, I, I predict it's going to go up to four or five hundred times with watches. You know, but but they won't be conscious. I mean, today it's like right now if I want to look at my phone, I got to stand up, pull out my pocket, turn it on. There, I just got to look. Right, that's a lot of effort. Going like that is not. So, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, you guys, I mean, I've worn wearables a little bit, but I've never been a big, uh, a big adapter, adopter of them. You know, kind of put them on for a day and take them off. And I had class for a while and, you know, used to like for 10 minutes.
kids. <laughs> just because it was so hard to deal with, I thought. And uh, But I'd be curious, you know, do you find it? You know, when I, I, I actually ran a, a panel at the World Congress last year on the wearables, and I had Pebble, the last guy, on the panel. And, and you know, Pebble folks were saying, like, well, notifications are the entire point of Pebble. So that, anyway, it'd be interesting to hear what you think. Yeah, sure. Um, I've been wearing this for several years at this point, and um, you've probably already seen me glance at it a couple times up here, and I was doing that kind of intentionally. Um, there's, in addition to interrupting me uh, with a notification, it, it turns out it also interrupts people I'm in front of. Um, and it turns out this gesture it has a very long standing meaning. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> I, I don't go. <laughs> so, when I go again. Uh, so, and, and this was pointed out to me several times. Um, like, even, even if I just look at it barely moving, your instinct is that I'm trying to check the time to go. And that turns out like that's not something I want to um, to communicate. So we got to figure out how to change that meaning. <laughs> but um, as far as interrupting myself, it's um, it is uh, there is definitely a balance between like if my if my watch buzzes, first of all, do I do I look? There's a check I do in my head. Like should I should I look at it? If I look at it, am I going to wait a couple seconds, wait for an opportunity, glance? Uh, kind of get the gist of what happens in sending a notification, and then if I am more curious, will I actually go and read it and like possibly scroll through it, which involves button pressing. Uh, so things like text messages are relatively high value communication to me because it means somebody themselves writing me a message and nobody else, uh, versus like uh, an app sending me something about the app or maybe an email is less high value to me, maybe. Um, Twitter mentions are, are less high value than uh, text messages. So I've actually done, gotten a system where I have um, my iPhone in my pocket uh, set to only vibrate. And it turns out you can customize vibration patterns for text messages and emails, and uh, also per person. So I've got a couple different patterns now where my phone will buzz, and the phone usually buzzes a second before the watch. So I know that if my phone buzzes a certain pattern and then the watch buzzes, it means one thing versus it means it's from somebody else. So then I can be more aware about what notifications I actually look at on my watch and whether to read them there. Uh, so yeah, it sounds complicated. You get used to it after like not that long. But um, <laughs> but it, it is very uh, a very conscious thing of like paying attention to how much I'm interrupting myself and what I'm doing right now and also who I'm with. But I wanted to, to um, sort of follow up on the social interaction point and ask Taylor a question about uh, Google Glass social interactions and um, her thoughts and sort of what that's been like. Yeah, I really agree with um, everything everyone's saying over here, especially uh, Aaron talking about the gesture, you know, looking looking at the wrist. I, I, I love technology and I'm so often frustrated by the gesture, thinking in the back pocket, pulling out the phone, like why why are we still at this point? Like I think, you know, bringing, bringing something to the wrist is progress, but I, I have a sometimes unpopular opinion that um, Wearables, in the sense of smartwatches, are, are a stepping stone. I think they're a familiar form factor, and I think socially we need them as a stepping stone to sort of like acclimate to, okay, like we're going to get notifications here instead of like here, they're not going to be down here anymore, they're going to like go up here. But I really do believe that having notifications, and by notifications I just mean any, any relevant data, like whatever you deem relevant or whatever, like, you know, the machine learning algorithm that you're subscribing to at the moment deems relevant, ideally that will be. Um, a good algorithm. Uh, I really think that having data in your field of vision is not only less socially disruptive, but is absolutely where we're going. And I like it. Like I want it to go there. I'm excited. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question and then open it up to the audience. Um, I just wanted to, to check. Um, so so it's my understanding, and, and this may be a correct understanding, but um, that really what you can do on a watch or wearable is limited in comparison to what you can do, say, on a phone or a tablet or things of that nature. I'm wondering if any of you can speak to sort of like limitations um, beyond just battery life. But like if you're if you're a business or you're a developer and you're you're looking at the opportunities here, like what are the, what's sort of the the sandbox in which you get to play? Um, it's true it's limited and to a certain extent it always will be because the screen is so small. Um, and I was actually 
when Apple had their big announcement, I thought Apple Pay was by far the most important thing. The Apple Watch was kind of like joking. You're actually going to swirl these little icons in the Philippine Times Square. Uh, and I have to, I just, I really hope that that was like a red herring and they're trying to mess with it. That's so, what people said about the phone at uh, first. But when, once we start going to more um, voice interaction, that will be less of an issue. Uh, but the key thing is that the watch is not going to be a replacement for a smartphone the same way that a smartphone is not a replacement for a laptop. They're good at different things, and in fact, we will, you know, the most useful things we don't know yet. You know, we don't know, really know what the killer app is. <coughs> right now, it's basically just taking the notification screen to see the wrist, which is good. It actually, even if it's just that, that is useful because um, it does take less time and it, enough less time that it actually fits under the threshold of your short-term memory to be less distracting. But that's just the beginning. You know, that's what we're going to do over the next couple of years. Um, when we have, if any of you saw the movie Her, where they have you know, the full AI that you can talk to and interact with, that can be done entirely on the phone because the phone is, at that point is basically just or, you know, the watch. It's basically just a network connection that is with you 24-7. And that's what so, so while Brent is commenting, if some if people want to start raising their hands, I'll start moving around the room with microphones. Okay. So I want to flag one thing that uh, this panel at Mobile World Congress last year that came up was uh, ingestibles. So, and this guy actually had one. This is not a sci-fi thing. This there's a company I think it's called Proteus Health. Proteus Health. They've developed it's the size of a sesame seed. And the vision is they get one of these embedded in every single pill you take. And it, then they have a patch today that you wear, and then that, that little, uh, it actually is a chemical process. It interacts with your stomach acid, and the, the, like the magnesium in your stomach acid, triggers a battery life long enough to send biometrics to this patch and then feeds off to an iPhone app. And so you start thinking, so I'm bullish. I mean, I, I like to watch for all the notification things talked about it's good for our business. However, I do, I do think that the killer app ironically is going to be the health benefits, right? The things where when you wear this thing, and you're, you know, if there is a pill you're taking every day, it's just seamlessly talking. And, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, they can prevent a heart attack by giving you a 15 second warning or that kind of thing, I think. Or you know, realize that you need to do something different health-wise. You're eating you know, pizza every night or whatever. So uh, I, I do think those are the things that will be Groundbreaking, and, and I think that's why Apple got into this. I don't think Apple just said, "Hey, Pebble looks kind of cheap. Let's make a little bit better, better version." I think Apple got into it because they have a vision that's they're not really sharing that's bigger than just convenient notifications and um, you know. all those sensors on the back. That's not just for that. Exactly. There's more going on. Yeah. That's right. Wait, could you could you elaborate? What are the sensors on the back? Do you well, know? they're being really vague, but it's like <laughs> the lights. On the back of the, there's like four different dots on the back of the Apple Watch, and you don't need that much just to measure your own. Okay. There's more going on. Definitely, it's got um, two different levels of, I think it's infrared, that lets you measure blood oxygen level. And once you have heart rate and blood oxygen level, you can start detecting a lot of different things when that sample once a second at a time. So there's, and, and they've been hiring people from the health industry, so clearly they're working. Um, question from the audience. So I guess you kind of answered that question that I was going to ask, but I would ask, uh, what is the groundbreaking thing, or what is it that Apple is doing differently that is going to be better than Android? Or the variable market is what you want to be set apart to side what's, what's the number one groundbreaking thing? They made it pretty. It looks yeah. like jewelry. I mean, the fact that it looks like something people already buy uh, <clears throat> makes a big difference in terms of mass adoption. The technology will improve, you know, everyone in five years will have these things that are half the size and last 10 years as long. But they're really nailing the fashion side of it. Really. I mean, healthcare is one definitely you don't serve that question, right? Uh, healthcare, fitness, certainly finance, because, because it looks into Apple Pay. And again, it's, don't think of it as a watch, think of it as something that will be with you 24 7 more so than you yourself. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means it's your authentication. The fact that it has your 
heartbeat and what an oxygen level means, it can actually be a biometric signature and act as but if someone else put on your watch, it would not authenticate them the way it would authenticate you. And that, you know, that starts to pervade society and becomes very interesting. At the same time, you know, you imagine a hundred years from now with this technology, we basically have perfect knowledge of everything. You know, you can know what anybody's doing at any time in the entire world. And now we're going to find out telepaths. I don't know what that world looks like. I don't think any of us do. So it's exciting, but scary. The world of telepath. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, question from back here. Um, Aaron, you talk about collecting a lot of data. I'm just curious, have you received any benefit from any of that data for yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I think the, the one of the pieces that I've been really happy I added is uh, tracking what I'm eating. I'm able to, you know, several days later, go back and look at, um, if, I'm, if I'm noticing I'm feeling a certain way, I'm like, I can go back and look at what I ate or when I ate, which is usually important. Um, and be like, oh, every time I don't eat dinner till 9, I'm noticing that I'm feeling crummy in the morning, or things like that. Um, uh, but in addition, you know, I, I use the uh, location data for a number of things. I, whenever I post notes on my website or, or you know, track what I eat, I don't have to worry about um, the thing I'm using at that moment knowing my location because the thing that it's posting to my website can go and grab my location from the location system. Um, so these things are all, you know, tied together through my own systems uh, and they, you know, talk to each other a lot. So uh, I have a lot of very, you know, minor benefits in that hopefully add up to something useful. But a lot of it's still just, you know, pure curiosity and like, I'll figure it out later. Have, have any of the other panelists been doing quantified self type things, or is Aaron the only one who's? I, I mean, Aaron's sort of an extreme case, but <laughs> as a general rule. Yeah, I try everything at least once. So, like, you know, I've tried the Fitbit, I've tried, I've messed around with the job a little bit, but I'm thinking about giving the second look since you've been wearing it for like a thousand years or something. Must be, must be good. Um, when the iPhone got like the motion code processor, I guess we're like the M8 now, I guess the last edition of the iPhone, it was like the M7 motion code processor, I started using a few apps that um, put that to good use for fitness tracking, which like in my life, fitness is like walking around at tech events mostly. <laughs> I don't do like a lot of, you know, I don't need something super granular and I don't need to like quantify some extreme sport that I do because that doesn't, that is not a thing that I do. But I wanted to know generally, um, I, wanted, I wanted kind of like broad strokes, general idea of like how much physical activity I have on any given day and maybe how that maps onto my mood. And I've used a few apps, like it's all been software side for me, thanks to the iPhone having that motion coprocessor now. Um, and I use, I guess like the Nike, I don't remember what it's called, just like Nike has kind of this app, I guess the Nike Fuel app is maybe what it's called, and it, it you know, converts your physical activity into like fuel points or whatever, which is a meaningless, a meaningless metric, but it's useful enough for me to kind of glance at and be like, okay, like I was really active that day. I was like running around, you know, at CES in Vegas. I like walked 1,000 miles. That's great. And I, I kind of log my mood and, and a series of other uh, iOS apps that I am constantly rotating. So I, I guess I try to pair software experiences like that. But I, I have like that Nike app just as kind of a broad strip thing. Thank you. Uh, one thing I, I just wanted to note because there may be other people who are in the same boat as me. I didn't realize that the iPhone was tracking my steps without me knowing it. Um, and so I, you know, I, you know, at some point I'd read something where somebody had gotten upset because they couldn't turn off the tracking, which made me realize that it had been tracking my my uh, my steps ever since I got the iPhone six and the iPhone five S. Was able to turn it on and actually see all that data. So if you don't know that your phone's doing that, you have one of those two devices. You can actually turn it on and get all that data. It's already tracking it for you. Um, just a little benefit. Okay, another question. Uh, so first of all, if this comes out a little sideways. Forgive me. I'm good with computers, not with words. But um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Also, I may be a bit short sighted here, but usually when I'm when I'm when the iPhone first came out and really made a touchscreen device a, a possibility in your pocket, lots of people said things like. Well, what's that good for? 
And, and I, I feel like I might be that guy now, but it, what it looks like you've got to me is, um, like, like I have type 1 diabetes, I have a logbook that keeps my blood sugars and my, my food intake in it. It's a pencil and paper. So aside from automating that process, do we, do we really see anything yet on the horizon for wearables that will significantly enrich your life, or is it, are we mostly in the early stages at this point? Um, if, you, if you don't know who Scott Hanselman is, you should. He's a Microsoft evangelist and podcaster who's had type 1 diabetes. He did a really great interview with a company who makes a glucose monitor that hooks into your iPhone. And I don't know if it's gone through FDA regulation at this point, but if you think of the wearable as a very convenient interface to your phone, and we already know that the phone can hook into lots of things that we didn't imagine seven years ago. Then the first thing would be the glucose monitor, that it can actually monitor you know, once a minute without doing finger pricks. The next step is having it actually adjust your glucose based on real scientific trends rather than psychologically what we feel to be true, which even with notebooks, humans are not very objective. It's very difficult to judge, and um, it, as Scott pointed out, it's very hard to be a diabetic, um, and every diabetic is different. They have different rates of absorbing glucose. So automating all of that, not just the tracking, but once you have the data, you can actually do something with it and automate the action part. That becomes very powerful. Um, and, but that requires having a smartwatch, a smart phone and a smart meter and a smart glucose injector. You know, a bunch of different pieces of technology which may not come all from the same company and they'll have to work together perfectly. So it's it's the interoperability parts that really worry me right now because once we have all the systems working together, that's when we can have the killer apps that do these amazing things that we don't think of today. But we've got to have that uh, that communication. Anyone else want to take that question? No? Okay. Hi, uh, I got a question for Taylor. Um, you mentioned uh, about the uh, liquid, the uh, displays in front of you. Is there any trends that are going that way? Maybe contact lenses or anything along those lines? Uh, what the next step of Google Glass might be? Well, uh, it depends on if you watch Black Mirror, for one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we won't talk about that now. It's a little unsettling. But, um, I think, I mean, a lot of people, there's this, you know, big pseudo news story that blew up, like, Google Glass is dead, whatever. Um, and Google just, I, I guess it was last week, it's all blending together for me now, but uh, Google just spun Glass basically into its own department and peeled it out of Google X Labs, which is its, like, moonshot laboratory, which is, like, where, you know, self-driving cars and all the crazy Google stuff comes from. Um, so Google's going underground for a minute, and it's it's not going to stop working on that technology. I mean, I, I talk to Google pretty frequently about that stuff because it's interesting to me. So I do think that um, the technology that is glass now is going to get refined. Like as a glass explorer, actually, maybe making this process kind of transparent would be useful. Um, the whole program was designed to, you know, field test this with some like really hardcore early adopters, like probably some of the people sitting up here. Like I'm Google Glass Explorer number 961 or something. And Google was constantly in touch with us, asking for feedback, and it actually became a pretty cool community um, on Google Plus, which is like you know not everyone's favorite place to hang out. <laughs> um, and they've been asking for all kinds of feedback. They know what's wrong with Glass, and I don't know if it's going to be Google that ends up, uh, I guess, coming through with this kind of technology. But they're going underground to to refine it, and they know what's wrong with it. Um, you know, battery life is obviously a huge thing. The camera, privacy implications. They're trying to decide what people really want out of these devices and what they don't need and how to balance that, like I was saying, the compromise thing earlier. Um, the other big thing, which is related but not the same, is the news that Microsoft just announced last week, which is pretty exciting, I think. Um, well, you've got like, you know, VR, you've got Oculus, which is like a whole different thing. And you've got AR, which Microsoft just threw its way, to way toward AR, which is really exciting, I think. Um, with could, you, could you give us those, uh, what AR and VR stand for? Yeah, VR is virtual reality, so like it's Oculus, I don't know how many, how many people I didn't say, like try it on Oculus, right? Okay, so like you put it on your head, you see nothing except the virtual environment that it's presenting to you. It's super immersive, it's really crazy. Um, 
you know, and you can simulate just about anything there. Whereas AR is augmented reality, and the idea uh, is is related but pretty different in that it it places like virtual objects or data. It kind of drapes like a, like a virtual layer onto your existing field of vision, and that also is different from like a heads-up display, which is sort of more what Google Glass is. It's just like you know, kind of giving you like a little ticker in the corner of your eye. But um, I think I'm excited about AR and what Microsoft's doing right now, and I'm excited to get up there and try it out myself, which I hope I get to do in the next few weeks. Anyone else? No. I want to have Tony Stark's lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what AR will do. I have a question for you guys about all the all this data that we all have. I've been wearing a fuel band and extractors for four or five years now. And yeah, I've got a bunch of data, big deal. Like the sleep, I was interested in it for like a few months. But then I was like, well, how can I affect my sleep? Like there was no, there was no doctor at the end of it prescribing something. Uh, same with fitness. Like, at the end of the day, the person that got me to go running was my friend on the block, or you know, my friend at work. That social interaction, that peer engagement, uh, whether it's with your doctor or whether it's with your friend, it just doesn't seem to like any of the apps or any of the ecosystems really address that yet. You really got to sift through the data yourself, and I just don't have the time to cross-reference my sleep patterns with my coffee intake, with my beer drinking, and travel. You know, it's just I just don't have the time for that. So. Yeah, I, I hear that. I think um, I think that speaks to one of the problems which we were talking about earlier, which is that uh, these devices are all their own silos right now. So none of the data is portable. So until we can use any device, send the data from one to the other, and have them all be aware of all of the data. We won't see a lot of that. Once once there's a system that can take your sleep plus your food plus your mood plus uh, steps and exercise and actually um, crunch away at it, you know, that's where it starts to get interesting. But uh, you know, yeah, there's like a million startups who are doing exactly that right now, which they'll go and connect to all these apps. But it's, that's not a sustainable situation either because it takes a lot of effort to bunch of data from one startups format to the other startups formats. So, you know, until we until we're in a place where the data is more portable and is more standardized, where it's easier to create products that do these um, comparisons and analysis, um, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna see a lot of that stuff that you're talking about. There was an interesting, I think it was NPR uh, story a few weeks ago about the whole health system. I think that the issue right now is the issue right now is that, you know the entire health system is built on you know you have to go see your doctor, but but there are doctors that are really you know becoming email centric right where you can just literally have email conversations, and so you know we got to think ten years from now when, when most people are what wearing something whether it's you know on your eyes or on your wrist who knows but think about that data now becomes really useful because your doctor can just log in and see it and now they they can professionally say. Well, I noticed this, this, and this, and they're going to be, you know, there's a whole new training regimen that's going to come up. It's going to completely transform the entire health industry. It's going to change the model, you know. So today, the problem is a doctor giving you treatment over email, A, it's probably a liability issue. B, they, get, they can't get reimbursed because they only get reimbursed by the health insurance for an office visit in most cases, right? So all of that has to change, you know, for the value of what you're saying, which is I'm collecting all this data, but I'm no doctor, so how what do I know? You know, I don't know what to do. But we're going to get there, in, in our, it's five years, or ten years, or twenty years, right? Depends on probably a lot of the system changing. But um, when you think about what's happening on all these fronts, I mean, to me, that's that that's incredibly exciting. I mean, if we're living in it, we're going to see it. It's going to transform, you know, the healthcare spending. Like that, that's the big, right? That's the thing that's going to transform this in a huge way. Uh, Josh had brought this up, but the uh, interportability issue, and obviously everybody's touched on it, but I was wondering, uh, my company, or the company I work for, is part of uh, the Open Interconnected Consortium. Uh, I, I don't know if people are aware of it, but I'm wondering if there are other groups or um, groups that people or companies that are being uh, kind of uh, joining or being part of to 
bridge that gap that we're, we're all talking about to make the solution, uh, you know, bring it faster or bring it to bring it here by, um, you know, a little bit quicker than. than, than that. So, like the old XKCD, there's, there's tons and tons of standards, and that would help more. Um, there, actually, there, there's you'll probably see a lot more stuff talked about of this year's mobile. Um, because you know, phones are all about the sensors now. No one cares that your screen is giant. Um, the most exciting thing for me, actually, there's a W3C group that has just spun up, which uh, Nokia is contributing to. I'm on uh, just this week, um, to talk about. It's still a little vague. We're calling it Web of Things, but really it's about data standards between sensors and we're not trying to impose a standard because nobody wants us to declare a new one but we're trying to at least bring all the different groups together to talk and hopefully smooth out a couple of issues. So it is happening. I think the industry is aware of this but it will take time. Um, for anybody who has an existing beachhead, there, there's that that desire, there's that belief that oh I could win the whole thing. And so I don't want to work with anybody else. And that's what it was at the very beginning. And everyone started to realize, okay, that's just not realistic. I'm not going to buy a Samsung dishwasher to go with my Samsung phone. And my mother-in-law actually has a Samsung washing machine. I can talk to a Samsung phone. She doesn't. I don't. Even if she did own it, I don't know what it would actually be. But they're starting to realize that we're going to have to work together. Um, but it's going to take time. So Apple houses and Google houses aren't, aren't the future. Like we just don't buy these pre-manufactured houses with all the Apple appliances in them and all the Google appliances in them. It's not that far off, right? Yeah, sure. so the recording houses are just organic. Sure. So actually, coming to the, I think you, you guys made like two big points earlier. Like one about the healthcare discussion, where really, like you know, the doctors and the insurance companies and the uh, regulatory stuff, they kind of will hold the progress for many years. And likewise, the earlier the e-commerce comment that was made, like you know, if uh, the watches can be used for payments and so on. So do you believe that uh, because uh, regardless, like the West, especially the US, uh, will continue to remain in this whole uh, notion of uh, approvals and uh, regulations, and the private, <laughs> private like, you know, capital uh, businesses running it, so the breakthroughs in these areas are actually going to come from elsewhere just like M Pizza came from Kenya, or like you know the, uh, the payments uh, came from all the way from Japan and everywhere else in Asia, and the healthcare will be like you know a much more demanding requirement there than there. So do you believe that? And plus, like the battery country is a little less because now it is just a software problem or a, like you know, much smaller device to be solved, which in any case is going to be manufactured on that side. So I guess I guess the question is a bit of like, do you have any sense of global sort of perspective feeding into this, to these devices um, and wearable devices? Um, and nobody's not, interested in them, but you know we're still at the very beginning of the technology cycle, so they can be very expensive and don't work very well. That said, uh, places like rural India, where there is a gigantic populace with very little electricity under a national healthcare system. Um, they are pioneering ways of managing large amounts of healthcare under those situations. They're the ones pushing for the tricorder, but you go to the village with no mains power and diagnose something in 30 minutes because I can't send off for a lab and come back in two weeks because the doctor won't be there for the next village. So I, different needs, um, create different incentives, um, and I think in this case the United States will actually benefit because our healthcare system moves so slowly. We'll probably end up importing things from other countries that are trying to do so. So technology, oftentimes, is um, driven. The adoption of technology is driven by the folks that are tech savvy, and they kind of pass it on to people that they know. That builds up momentum. With uh, something like a watch, where most of my colleagues abandoned watches 15 to 20 years ago, 
I can't think of anyone under the age of 30 that I know that actually has a watch. How do you see? <laughs> okay, one. He's just bragging that he's young. <laughs> do you see? Uh, how do you see watches actually being adopted? Do you see there being enough people that actually go out and buy a watch that you achieve some sort of critical mass where this technology becomes ubiquitous? Yeah, I think that's. I mean, there's the whole. You know, there's there's as, as many of us that are. Optimistic about the watch. There's, just, there's another group that's pessimistic, right? I, you get really strong arguments with people, and I think you know, that's that's the big question: is is will the form factor stick? Will people want to wear it? I mean, I haven't had a watch in a long time myself, um, but I as soon as I saw it, I knew right away that I wanted to buy it, not just because I needed one professionally, but that I was actually interested in it. So, you know, I I don't know if the form factor will be appealing. I think the price, you know, we've got Apple at the high end, Pebbles now positioning to be, I think it was reading Europe, right? Pebbles positioning to be uh, uh, the bargain sort of wearable. And so, you know, uh, but I'll tell you, I've, I've got two teenage daughters and everybody has an iPhone or everybody wants an iPhone. Like that's, that's the world of high school today, according to, you know, my sample of two. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like, talk about brand preference. I mean, it's like, if, if you don't have one already, that's what you, you know, want to have. So I'm guessing that the watch will become that next stat symbol. Honestly, I, I think it will be. And I think that sort of transforms it. But, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, our opinions are as good as, as anyone's in terms of. 15 years ago, 15 years ago, most people did not carry a cell phone, you know, a dumb feature phone with them everywhere. And now, basically, everybody in the United States does. Habits could change, and if the phone, if the watch adds some value beyond just pretty uh, you know, digital basics, I think it will. So, uh, uh, Taylor, did you have something to add? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I really don't think that Apple's entrance into this market can be like overestimated. Like, Apple defined the tablet when when the iPad came out. We all made like jokes about the name. We're like, what the hell are we gonna do with this? You know? I mean. And granted, it remains a complementary device. It's not a device that's replaced laptop computers. Um, it, it's a complementary device, and it's a little bit extraneous in that way. And it's a luxury device. But uh, Apple is the consumer company that can come out and say, here's this thing that you didn't know you needed until now, and you'll go buy it. Like, I mean, I think it's all in line with Apple's debut of the smartwatch buildings. So, for the panelists, um, how many of you will be buying an Apple Watch? Oh, you okay. I'm actually, I want to see the software. Still, yeah. Okay. So, I'll probably get one. So, audience, who's intending to buy an Apple Watch? Raise your hand. How about an Android Wear? Anyone? Anyone currently own an Android Wear? Okay, a couple of people. Um, the Microsoft Band. Anyone? <laughs> Uh, Microsoft has a product called the Band. It actually. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even trying to joke that time. Sorry. <laughs> so, so earlier you touched on some of the, uh, shall we say, antisocial aspects of wearables, the, 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 the gesture, but uh, something that drives a lot of adoption in, in, in technologies is, are the social aspects of, of uh, various. Approaches. Do you see any of those coming, you know, some pro-social aspects to wearables in the near future? I mean, Apple, like, Apple Watch has that cute thing where you can, like, what is it called? Where you, like, send, yeah, you send somebody, like, a heart. That's, like, the most superficial example ever. But you can send somebody a heart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think this is better than putting a screen in front of my face. I mean, I do think it will become... You know, sort of like, actually, you're so important that I'm not going to pull my phone out right now. I'm just going to let my wrist. I mean, there, there could be some transformation. Kind of yes. um, I really, I do think there'll be transformational things, but we don't know what they are yet. When, so, it's really dating. So. so I graduated in 97, and I had a, a nine-month internship at Sarah Park, which, even though they invented everything in the 70s, they were still doing cool stuff. <laughs> and I saw some, like, early e-paper and early, high DVI screens. But one of the strangest things was um, 
that they had, well, they had a couple of ambient interfaces. One was like a little string that would twirl around, and the speed was based on how much network traffic was going on. And the idea was to surface some piece of information to you in a way that wouldn't necessarily grab your immediate attention, but you'd sort of be passively aware of it. Uh, much like a, a white noise or the sound of your car engine. You, you, know, you don't really notice the sound of your car engine until it changes. Um, that's the sort of passive information. So they had another one that was these little um, little cylinders of wood, and when you rolled one of them, one across the room, connected by the network, would also roll. And this was a way of communicating in a non-verbal way, just very passively, that you were thinking about somebody else. Like, I'm on a business trip, I can have this thing in my hotel room when my wife has hers at home. And it seems like an awful lot of effort for something very trivial. But you know, the effort will go away. We all know the technology will improve. Uh, and Apple showed that with a little you know, sharing your heartbeat with somebody. Um, these are intimate devices that can be shared with the intimate people in your life. I don't think the heartbeat and drawing the little thing is, you know, maybe it's good for now. Somebody we haven't heard of is going to come up with this really interesting way of doing it in a year or two, maybe even just by Christmas. And we're going to start thinking about this stuff differently. It will truly be the personal computer, even more so. Um, I was just going to add uh, that uh, having this Pebble one that we've worn for so long, um, there are a number of situations in which uh, I'm able to take advantage of the fact that I have the ability to see, the, see something on or use it to interact with my phone from the watch. Um, in a way that doesn't involve me actually pulling up the phone, because the gesture of pulling up the phone is way worse than glancing at your wrist if you're you know, talking with somebody or having a conversation. And um, you know, things like you're waiting for an email from somebody or a text message from somebody and you're trying to do something else and you're in a situation and you don't want to interrupt that as much as possible while you also know that you're waiting for this thing. So having a way to you know, very quickly with low effort glance at it or, uh, or interact with your, with your watch that way is actually a, a huge benefit um, that can provide you know, these more positive um, uh, examples of, of not having to use your phone, which is much more awkward and much more blatant gesture. So we've um, got this question here and then one more and then um, we'll wrap up. Hey, um, I was just wondering, you know, right now the ecosystem very much, you have a central computer with your cell phone and these wearables around you. Do you ever see the future where there's no more cell phone and wearables are powerful enough to just be standing on their own? And do you think that's a good thing? Or there's actually there's a watch right now, like a company called Omi, I think they're French company. And it has a SIM card, and it's fully, you know, it's fully a phone and a device. So it's been out, it's been out for like a year, year and a half. So I, I do think, especially with the developing countries, you know, could, could this just be a device? I think so. So in, in 20 years, our lives are going to be bathed in radiation. So <laughs> we'll have to make the case or wear a little bit of clothing. Um, so there's a project I happen to know because it's part of uh, a different division of Nokia called LTEM. Much like Bluetooth LE is low power Bluetooth for small devices that have that are more like sensors that have low data ratings. LTEM is for machine to machine communication. The idea being that you know, I want to put a Rain monitor in the middle of the field. Um, I don't want to have to get Wi Fi or, or fiber. It should be able to just go up to the internet. And for the most part, the carriers have excess capacity. I mean, they, they have high fixed costs, but their variable their costs are very low. So it's in their interest to use up this capacity with lots of little things just sending out the occasional bit of data. That is going to work its way into wearables very quickly, I think. So, yeah, I. I would not be surprised. Now, whether you're going to want to make a phone call through it, and eh, you know, maybe, maybe not. It will depend more on the interface, and it will get to the point where something a phone or an internet device is the same. Just the, how much you have to pay for rising each one. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. So my question is, uh, I guess mainly for Taylor and, and Josh, it's a two-part thing. Um, Apple's really good at brand extension. What's the brand extension going to be with the with the, uh, the watch? And then brands in general have become, I guess, 
you know, over the past 10, 15 years, we thought brands would sort of become a weaker force, but you know, with open source and people are managing their own technology, but they've actually become even stronger at the same time. So what does the future hold in terms of brands? Um, I mean, I guess, I think this is going to be kind of a make or break moment for Apple in a lot of ways, you know, like the post-Jobs era. I think this is like going to be a huge gamble and Apple is either going to own the space entirely and we're going to define it by Apple, just like we do with Apple computers for the most part, or it's going to flop and we're going to enter some kind of crazy new era in which there's like a land grab and other people have opportunities. So I think um, in terms of Apple's <laughs> branding reach, I think the opportunity is massive and the risk is also massive, but we know that Apple is a company that's all about refining um, maybe already existing ideas <laughs> and making them look shiny and slick and selling them to us. Um, and I think, you know, this, it's, it's going to be a really, really interesting year in that way, especially for a company that's defined so much of like modern uh, consumer technology. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so I want to I want us to close with just one sort of bigger picture question. So 2015, we've got Apple Watch coming out. Um, hopefully, some you know some applications, maybe some stuff that you guys know about that all of us don't know about. Like, what are you what are you looking forward to most related to wearables this coming year, um, and anything else that you know, like, sort of in that space? I guess I'll start because I have the mic. Um, I will talk about a crazy thing that's hard to believe even exists in some ways, just for the sake of mentioning it. Um, earlier, I think you were asking a question over here about uh, sort of behavior modification. It's like you're collecting all this data, you're accruing all this like personal data, and you're like, you know, have these strings of it, spreadsheets, wherever you have it, you're collecting data, collecting data. Um, it's not necessarily modifying your behavior. So there are devices that are interested in doing that, which is sort of interesting, sort of terrifying, granted. Um, I actually have like a neuroscience background. I used to work in neuroscience research, so I'm like super interested in like neurotech. And there's like I have a thing called the Muse headband, which I actually had mentioned before, but it's like a, it's a pretty sophisticated uh, consumer grade EEG headband. It's all about like monitoring your mental states. So there's that. That's another monitoring device. And then just uh, last month, I saw this device called the Think. Has anyone heard of this thing? It's like this crazy headband that you wear that is right now flying uh, under the radar of FDA regulation somehow. <laughs> For how much longer, I, I don't know. Um, you know, they, they were rather secretive about the whole thing, but it's a, it's a headband that you wear that actually provides like electrical stimulation to certain parts of your brain um, on the surface of your skin, and it works. Like, anecdotally, it works. Like, you can alter your mood with a device that you wear. And that's not science fiction. That's the it's Radio the Lab had a had a recent um, podcast about like what's it e ECG or EKG or like they're like YouTube videos where people are actually rewiring the brain using electricity. Yeah, like most <laughs> yeah. of the devices are like EEG. Um, they're like modeled after you know uh, devices in the health world, obviously, but they the costs have been reduced to such a point, uh, and I guess the the you know locality is identified in such a way that we can actually like, put on a headset, and the two options were like you can be I guess it's like stimulated, like have a, basically an electrical cup of coffee put into your brain based on this headband thing that you wear. That was pretty slick to begin with. Or you can be like soothed, so there's just like two locations and stimulated. So that's just like a crazy out there thing that I think is due to actually come out this year until the FDA hears about it, in which case it will be buried forever. Can you control others of it too? I mean, <laughs> if you can get them to wear it, you definitely can. So I had one, but she just changed it. <laughs> uh, I think it's, you know, I think it's going to be interesting. I don't know if it's going to happen this year, but you know, I look at, you know, I have two teenage daughters, Snapchat, and I, I don't use Snapchat, but they use it all the time, and it's redefining social conversation with teenagers. You know, like they're they're like taking photos constantly. It replaces the texting. It replaces so many things, and I'm, I am curious, you know, this whole idea, like a little beating heart thing you can share. I think there's going to be something like that that's just completely out there. That if we if we try to predict what it is, we would laugh at it today. Like if we said, "Oh, you can take a photo and upload it every you know two minutes to a bunch of people who are going to want to look at these disappearing photos," we would say that's the same. <laughs> but it's a real thing, and it's worth billions of dollars, and it's changing society, like or not. So I'm curious to see what the innovation is going to be around this completely new form factor that can actually reach out and squeeze you know squeeze your wrist literally. We talk about intimate devices, they can actually, you know, 
you know, make you feel feel a digital experience. So that's I think pretty interesting. Damn, you took mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's her. She's just making So when I when I was at uh, Palm, um, I did a little bit of this in Sun, but at Palm, this was my whole job: was going out and basically doing developer education and teaching them about the technology, the SDK. But what I enjoyed about it was talking to developers and finding what they were working on. Because for the, you know, for the most part, these were not like guys at Facebook or Activision. You know, these were small developers who just had this weird idea. And it was something that I had not thought of, that nobody else in the market had thought of. And 90% of them were crap, or crap for 90% of the market, but for 10% of the people, it was really awesome. And I was always excited to see, you know, Next time I go to an event, what are the 10 new crazy ideas for using a smartphone? Because we've now basically democratized access to a compass, an accelerometer, and a network connection. And there's so many things we can do with that. And that's you know, five years old now. What are we going to do with democratized access to a network connection and your heartbeat? I mean, there, there's just going to be so many things that we haven't thought of. And so I, the thing I'm most excited about is by this Christmas, there are going to be a full cycle of apps for the Apple Watch. And there's going to be, you know, there'll be the usual things that we're expecting. Hopefully Apple will finally open up Siri so we can have Siri as like your personal trainer, you know, telling you to do your reps and stuff. But there's going to be apps that we haven't thought of that are going to be really exciting. Um, as I'm sure you got right now, I like to track as much as I possibly can about myself. So anything that can help you do that is great. Um, there's a couple of things that I'm looking forward to. One is the... Uh, I'm actually not sure I entirely believe it, so we'll see what happens when it launches, but it's called the Vessel, and it, it's a cup. And you pour stuff in it, and it knows what it is, and then it can track exactly what you're drinking. Like, it'll, it'll know that it's coffee versus what type of alcohol versus water or tea, like, I'm not sure I actually believe it, so we'll see what happens when it gets here. Uh, but if that works, that's going to be great. Um, carry that cup around all the time, for sure. Awesome. Well, Taylor, Brent, Josh, Aaron, thank you very much. <laughs>